Continue to work on arrangements for his funeral and just remember the remember his life and his years of service to SBU and even in the Bolivar community after he retired and just uh, the, the celebration on Saturday can can go well and just be with Becca's grandfather's and prepares for surgery and the surgeons that they have wisdom on, on how prepared he is for the surgery and, and how to take the appropriate precautions with that so they can address the issue with his back. Just pray to be with us as we continue to look at advanced calculus. Uh, I'll be with Greg as he's on the, the road and the whole football team traveling to New Mexico that they have a safe trip and uh, represent SB well on the field. It's a great name. Amen. All right, so the last time we, we looked in 1-1 one, one at numbers, uh, suggested some problems you can look at. I don't collect those, but when I give you a homework site, it's going to be a problem similar to that. So, anybody look at those? Besides Josh. Anybody look at those? Wait, this isn't you? Oh, it's not you, Josh. <laughs> 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 and have questions? For, for this class, I will give you a homework set on paper that, that's due. The, the ones from the book are, are practice to help you kind of learn the material with that. But. On the, I guess I have one. On the okay. proof, is it like really similar to what we did in class pretty much like with the same reasoning or was there something? Uh, so what the proof is, um, 60, that there's no rational that x cubed equals 2. Correct. So it's proof? still the same reasoning, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we assume it is rational and push and find that both the numerator and denominator have to have factors of 2. Okay. I see. And share a common factor. Which is quite different from how we would go about, say, proving that pi is irrational. I'm not sure I want to attempt to prove that pi is irrational. Um, I've probably seen a proof that pi is irrational, but radicals are fairly easy because those we can square and do things with, and pretty much any proof like that would be the same same type of reasoning, looking at the factors. Okay. Well, we're going to look in one two a little bit more at inequalities. We, we saw some language of inequalities in one one. Between two numbers, we could put a, a, another number 
we did some things with inequalities, but it will be helpful to kind of refresh our memory uh, a few things about inequalities. So, if you had to write this inequality in a different way, so A is less than B, can you think of some other forms we might put that in that they might be a different way of working with this that, that might actually help us a little bit more? Well, so. Maybe we'll see that as we think about in solving an inequality, say we had, say, 6x uh, plus 8 less than 10x plus 4. In terms of solving that, there'd be some things we could do, we would try to do. Well, what's one of the things we might typically we try to do on solving an inequality. So when you say move the variables, I mean, add the same thing to both sides? Or subtract, I mean, adding the negative would be the same as subtracting. So we can subtract 8 from both sides, and as long as we do the same thing to both sides, the inequality stays the same. We can subtract 10x from both sides, negative 4x is less than negative 4. They did all the subtraction correctly. Well, what might be helpful, what I was kind of going at here, would be, suppose we subtract b from both sides and looked at a minus b less than 0. So sometimes it's easier to figure out when a quantity is positive or negative rather than how one expression compares to another. It's just sort of easier to compare to zero than it is one expression to another. So get everything on one side and look at where it's either less than zero or greater than zero. And if we could do one, we could do the other. And even this one, less than zero, if I multiply through by negative one, what happens? The, the inequality flips direction. So whenever we multiply by a negative, the inequality flips direction. So as we look at solving inequalities, we can multiply the same quantity of both sides, but we have to know whether it's positive or negative. If it's a positive quantity, the inequality stays the same direction. But if it's negative, the inequality is going to reverse. So if we multiply both sides here by negative 1 fourth, we get x. It's going to flip the inequality x is greater than 1. And so we've solved the inequality here. We've got an expression that has the same solution as there, but now x related to a number. And we could put it in this form. We could do it on a number line. x is greater than 1. We could do interval notation. You know, lots of different forms we could give that answer. But in terms of trying to solve the inequality, Adding or subtracting the same thing to both sides is fine. Multiplying both sides is fine as long as we know the sign of what we're multiplying by. If it's negative, we reverse. If it's positive, it, it stays the same direction. A couple other things that we kind of like to, to categorize, if we've got two quantities, say A and B, that we know are both positive, and, and A is less than B, can we conclude anything about the reciprocals? 1 over A and 1 over B. Smaller denominators make for bigger fractions. Or you may have even learned that. I mean, you probably didn't use that terminology. But 
even in kindergarten, or, or maybe earlier than that, if you had one cake that you were sharing with three friends, that was so much better than sharing it with 25. The fewer friends you're sharing it with, the, more each piece, the bigger each piece is, you get more cake that way. So, smaller denominators make for bigger fractions. Pro provided we know both of them are positive. What if we raise both sides to a power? Can we know what the inequality is going to do? If A is smaller than B and we like square both sides or cube both sides, we can't. Hmm? B would be bigger. Yeah, the, the relation stays the same. For that matter, a square root, it would stay the same. That doesn't matter the power. Whatever we as long as we do the same thing to both sides. All the power functions are increasing. So if we have a smaller input, we get a smaller output. Be it a positive power. You know, P well, P an integer power, where we get something like this. Or P a fractional power. Or we've got something more like that, they're still increasing. So smaller inputs always give smaller outputs. So if we know how the inputs are related, we know how the corresponding outputs are related. Well, our challenge with inequalities become, I mean, comes about when we start seeing more complicated things that are not necessarily just linear. I mean, if they're just linear, we can go through the process we did here, and as long as we handle multiplying by a negative correctly, we should be able to get the correct result. And in fact, there, there's a way even without perhaps handling the negative, well, let me approach this a slightly different way. Suppose here I took negative 4x plus 4 less than 0. Well, I can figure out where negative 4x plus 4 equals 0. It equals 0 at 1. And that splits the real line into two parts. On this part, if it's true any place on this part, it's true every place. If it's true any place on this part, it's true every place. The only place we could change is right at 1, where we actually get 0. And so if we look, say, to the right of 1, at 2, negative 4 times 2 plus 4 is less than 0. That's true. It's true over this entire region. With linear inequalities, that's typically not how we approach them. But when the inequalities get more complicated, that in fact is exactly, I think, the easiest way to approach them. So if we see an inequality like this, negative x minus 4 times x plus 5 times x plus 6 greater than 0. Now this one was nice in that it's already factored out for us. If it wasn't, well, we'd have a lot of work to, to factor. But where would we actually get equal to 0? 4? negative 5 and negative 6. There, there ain't anywhere else. Each factor gives us one place where we can equal to z, equal 0 and, and that's it. And if we think a little bit about whatever this graph would look like, we either start from below the axis, we go through 0 and above, and then come back, or we just touch the axis, we're not quite sure which. But the only way to get from above the axis where we're positive to below is to go through zero. There's, this particular function never jumps. So if, if, if we're above somewhere in here, we're above all the way. We cannot be above for a while and then below because somewhere we'd have to go through zero and we just don't do that here. We've decided the three places we go through zero, 
those are the only three places we could change signs. So there, there are four intervals we've got to consider and identify, well, what's the sign on each one of those? So if we look, say, at negative 7, we get negative, times negative 7 minus 4, negative 7 plus 5, negative 7 plus 6. I'm really not concerned here at the exact value. I'm concerned, is it positive or negative? Positive because we've got a negative, another negative, another. All four factors are negative. As long as there's an even number of negatives, the result will be positive. Which in this case is what we wanted. So at least from six, negative six left, that's part of our solution. And we don't have to look at all these other ones. Because the only place we could go from positive to negative is go through zero and we don't have any more out here. And we can do that on each of the subintervals. So we could look here. Got to be careful to put something that's actually in that interval. Well, again, it's very helpful here to realize I don't care the value. I want to know the sign. Negative, a negative, a negative, and a positive. Three negatives and a positive will give us a product of negative, negative something. I don't really care what. That's negative. That's not part of my solution here. Now, a lot of the ones that, that this would produce very much have an alternating pattern, but before. We shouldn't just assume it alternates, because it is possible that this would be negative, come up and just touch zero, and then go back down. That doesn't happen here. For that to happen, we actually need the factor there more than once, where it just come up and touch. But we could continue and analyze this. And so we get our solution here of everything up to negative 6, and then from negative 5 to 4. So we can check our check our answer, but I, I clicked on the wrong thing and I actually changed the problem, which is why this answer doesn't look like our answer because it's no longer our problem. I, I missed when I was trying to click check the answer, but you can work through and do a few of those if you'd like. Well, what happens when? We look at something like, oh, x over x plus 1 greater than 1 over x. As we look at that, what might our first instinct be to try? Okay, multiply by x. Start trying to get rid of the fractions. That, that's a strategy we often employ. Well, if we multiply both the same thing or the same thing to both sides and it's positive, the inequality stays that direction. If it's negative, the inequality flips. Is x positive or negative? Yeah, we, we don't know. Theoretically, I suppose we could follow that through in some different cases, but rather than try to do that, let's approach this differently, because we, we really don't want to multiply by a variable, because we don't know if it's positive or negative, and, and we need to know to know what happens. So is there a way we can approach this without multiplying both sides by some variable? So if I get everything to one side, I'd have x over x plus 1 minus 1 over x greater than zero. And now at least we can think a little bit about what's going on here graphically. We're trying to figure out where this function is above the x-axis if we graph it. Well, in that form it's a, a little hard to graph. So we still want to kind of work to, to try to do this, <clears throat> th 
this expression, if we're going to try to do some sort of sign analysis, we really need to kind of identify where we might change signs. Where is the denominator zero? Where is the numerator zero? Well, for that we actually just need one function, or one fraction on the left, not two. So do we remember how we can go from that to one fraction? Get the same denominator, which in this case, what denominator do we want? x times x plus 1. So I need to convert this, multiply numerator denominator by x. Here, multiply numerator denominator by x plus 1. So we're just changing the form. I mean, here we change it to a form we thought would be a little easier. We're continuing to change it to a form so that we have the same denominator. We've got now x squared minus x minus 1 over x times x plus 1. Well, I can tell where the denominator might be 0. In terms of a graph, that actually is a place we could be positive and all of a sudden jump to negative because there could be a vertical asymptote there. So here there were no asymptotes. This was continuous. We only go from positive to negative going through 0. It is possible we could change signs at x equals 0 up the asymptote one side and then be on the other, the, the other end of the spectrum on the other side of that asymptote. And again, we don't know whether that's going to be the case, but that's where we could have that happen. So we could have something interesting happening at x equals 0, where there's an asymptote, and x equals 1, not 1, negative 1, where there's an asymptote. Can the numerator be 0? What, what would we normally try to do with confronted a problem like that, just looking at the numerator? Well, that, that, yeah. I, I was going to say we try to factor it, but, yeah. but well, failing. We can't, I know we can't factor it. All right. So, so, so. You, you already jumped a step ahead. You thought about factoring. No, that doesn't factor. Right. We've got to pull out our old friend, the quadratic formula. So the numerator could be 0, where x is negative b. I should ask you for the, your old friend, the quadratic formula. So negative b. Or a C all over 2A. So it is an old friend. We were, well, somebody remembered it. So we've got here 1 plus or minus what, the square root of 5 all over 2. The square root of 5 Something bigger than 2, right? But not as big as 3. So about 2.2. So 1 plus or minus 2.2 over 2. So I guess we get what, about 1.6 and about minus 0.6. So that's where this rational expression is equal to 0. So we could change signs there as well. And our challenge then is to figure out, okay, well, just like here, what's the sign on each piece? This time we've got, what is it, five pieces, two asymptotes, two zeros. We always have one more piece than our, our split points. So if we test, say, at minus 2, this form may be the easiest. Let's see. So minus 2 squared, minus a minus 2, 
minus 1 over minus 2 times minus 2 plus 1. 4, 6, 5 over some positive. So again, we, we don't really care the exact value. We need to do it carefully enough that we get the sign. So it's positive there. Which is part of what we want. So at least from negative infinity up to negative 1, that's part of our solution. <coughs> Now, I'm a little concerned in between negative 1 and negative 0.6, because my negative 0.6 was an approximation. So I'm actually going to pick a test point here, a lot closer to negative 1, just in case I'm off a little with negative 0.6. I don't want to accidentally end up on the wrong side of negative 0.6. So I'm going to go really close to negative 1. So negative 0.9 squared minus negative 0.9 minus 1 over negative point nine times negative point nine plus one. Point eight one plus point nine minus one over a negative. Numerator is going to be positive over a negative. We get a negative. Yeah, I don't really care the exact number. I mean, if, if we could pull out our calculator, but we're kind of trying to solve this without just plugging lots of values into our calculator. And again, we, we could continue with this. Uh, and we'll discover pretty much what we would have had we just graphed this function in the first place. But it needs to be that function, not, I mean, there's really no way to graph that one. And in fact, graphing them and comparing where is this one above that, it's a lot harder to compare too. It's much harder to look at where one function is positive. So x over x plus 1, you have to watch our parentheses minus 1 over x. So from negative infinity to negative 1, it is positive. From negative 1 to wherever it's 0, it was negative. And we've got a pretty good idea where it was 0, about negative 0.6. And if we continue our analysis, we would have found this also Kind of, well, it goes back and forth between negative and positive. If we had any repeats on factors in the numerator or denominator, we could just touch zero or go up the asymptote and then come back down. We wouldn't have to, to flip. But in this one, we do end up flipping. And so for where this is positive, it's positive here, <coughs> here, and there. And that's what we also see from the graph, up to negative 1, from negative 0.6 to 0, and then from this, which we decided was about 1.6, on. So there's very much kind of a connection between a graph and our, our solution. Let's consider another example. Where we've got some, some inequalities with things a little bit more complicated than just linear. Suppose we were to solve the inequality x minus 3, well, the absolute value of x minus 3 plus the absolute value of x plus 3 is less than 5. Or, or no, I want to go 8. Let's go less than or equal to. This 
this one turns out there, there are lots of different ways we can approach this inequality. And in fact, there are some interpretations of the absolute value that, that are going to be helpful for us to think about as we proceed in advanced calculus. So one, one of the interpretations of the absolute value that I don't think we stress enough is, in, in general, I mean, the absolute value of x minus 3 is the distance from x to 3. How far are we away from 3? So if this distance were, say, 2, we could go 2 units to the right or 2 units to the left. And those are the two places where the absolute value of x minus 3 is equal to 2. And so we kind of, to see our distance that we're given, the center of, of an interval, and what, what would the two endpoints be? If we can go no more than 2 units away from 3, how far could we go? And in fact, if, if this were an inequality, absolute value of x, say minus 3 less than or equal to 2, we can start at 3, go up to 2 units to the right, but no farther, and up to 2 units to the left, but no farther, and still have the distance less than or equal to 2. We can't go any more than 2. Kind of, you know, blow up our balloon. A radius of 2. Sounds a little weird to talk a radius of 2 because normally we think of two dimensions, a radius of a circle, but we can have a radius of an interval, kind of blowing up the balloon just in one dimension. Blow it up till it's you know, two units from the center, and we can figure out where those two edges are. Well, how does that come back to, to here? Well, let's think a little bit. about this. In terms of distance, what this statement is saying is the distance from x to 3 plus the distance from x to the, what am I doing the distance from x to there? For distance, I need a subtraction. I don't have a subtraction. Is there a way I can write x plus 3 using a subtraction? Minus a negative 3. So the distance from x to negative 3. And we want that distance less than or equal to 8. Let's think a little bit about our, our, our distances. Say I pick a point in here. Can I figure out the distance from x to 3 plus the distance from x to negative 3? What's that distance going to be if I'm somewhere in, in here? What's this distance plus that distance? Yeah, it's, it's always 6. Wherever I am in here, this distance plus that distance is going to be 6. So anyway, you're in here, that sum equals 6, which is less than or equal to 8. So at least we've got this much. question becomes, well, what, what if we kind of go outside this? Hmm? All right, so, so where did you get 4 and negative 4? 
So you sort of you know, tr tried a few things to see how far we could go? Because yeah. okay. if you do 5, then I replace 5 with x, then just 5 plus 3 is 8, but then... We've got some more. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if we look at it here, if we're over here, in a sense we're going to have six, 6 units plus a little bit more for this distance, and then that little bit more for that distance. So how much a little bit more could we go if we've got six plus two little bit mores? And I want the distance less than eight. The, the little bit more. We, we, we could go at, you know, up to one unit, but no further. If we look at it that way. So I could go to four, because I'm going to have six plus whatever this is twice. This is the distance from x to three this plus 6 is the distance from here to negative 3. So twice whatever this is, plus 6, I need to keep under 8. And so if I go to the other side, over here, that distance plus 6 is this. This distance is that. So twice this plus 6, I've got to keep under 8. I could go at most one unit this way. So everything between minus 4 and 4, we could actually include the two endpoints because it's less than or equal to. So, so that's one way we could argue this. There are other ways. Um, Another way that might be helpful um, do we know what the graph of the absolute value of x looks like? The v shape. So, what's the absolute value of x minus 3 look like? Does it move it up, down, left, right? That would be correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, in this case, if we get it wrong, we'll get that one wrong, and it'd be a case where two wrongs would make a right. Uh, uh, correct. <laughs> <'Cause, 'cause laughs> whichever this does, that's the opposite. But it, it is three units to the right. I usually look at the, the important part of the V is an input of zero. X equals three gives me an input of zero. So it moves the, the bottom of the V over here. So that's the absolute value of x plus 3. This is the absolute value of x minus 3. And we don't do a lot of, of adding two functions. We do a lot of do a function then add a constant, which shifts it up or down. We do some adding something inside, which shifts left or right. We don't do a lot of adding two functions, but I mean, we could think of that a little bit if, if we add this height and that height, it turns out kind of wherever we are, we get the same height. And, and for that matter, we could do kind of the, the third technique. This is the absolute value of x minus 3. This one's the absolute value of x plus 3. Well, if this is the absolute value of x minus 3, what is just this portion of the graph? Can, can we write that without the absolute value? Just that half? I mean, normally if we see an absolute value and we're trying to drop the absolute value, we need to think a little bit about, do we know whether what's inside is positive or negative? If we know it's positive, we can just drop it, right? Well, if we're bigger than 3, is x minus 3 positive? Oh, yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. And so this portion, we could just drop the absolute value. This is the line y equals x plus 3. This part is not. This part is actually the negative of that. Is it x plus 3? Oh, no, x minus minus. Okay. 
the x plus 3 is over here. This part is x plus 3, because what's inside is positive when we're bigger than negative 3, and this side is the negative of that. So we've got kind of the three regions. And here we're adding the x plus 3, this rule to that rule. And what happens when we combine those two rules? We actually get a constant. So it's just like we did over here. In between the two, the, the sum of the two distances happens to be a constant. It's 6. Over here, we've got this rule added with this one. Which is then what? Minus 2x. Actually, just minus 2x. And we need to make sure that's less than 8, so x needs to be bigger than minus 4. So, from minus 4 on, well, minus 4 to minus 3, these two don't add up to too much. And then similarly over here, these two parts, x plus 3 added to x minus 3, adds up to 2x, and we want that less than 8. We need x less than 4. So that's kind of another way we could approach this. Sp split things at 3 and negative 3 because that's where these rules change from. Can we just drop the absolute value or do we need the negative of what's inside and, and just work with them that way? But we get this kind of interesting looking graph then of, let me turn this one off. So the absolute value of x plus 3 plus the absolute value of x minus 3. Now we first might look at this thinking, uh, where's my graph? Do we notice, wait a minute, it's, it's 6 for a while. And to the left, it's the same as y equals. 2x, negative 2x, and to the right, it's the same as y equals 2x, and that really is what's happening, and in between, it's the constant 6, and we'd be looking at, well, can we figure out where this graph is below x equals 8, it's mainly where, where do these two intersect, and so we could approach it that way, so there, there are a number of ways we could approach inequalities, but they don't have to be, I mean, they, they can be considerably more complicated, because I'm not sure in, in calculus we ever really look at anything like that. We did some with quadratics, and, and some with polynomials, a few with rationals, because we take derivatives, trying to figure out where the derivative is positive, negative, so we would do some of that. We really didn't ever try to do anything with derivatives of absolute values. There's a problem with the derivative of absolute value of abrupt changes whenever we change from one rule to the other. There is no derivative. That abrupt change of direction means there's, we can't talk about a tangent line right here. And so in calculus, we didn't do very much with the absolute values because as a function, it just didn't work nicely for derivatives. But we can do some work here trying to figure out, well, what would our solution be for the inequality? So we've looked here at 1, 2, and let's see. In the section, if you look at 3, 4, and 5, and then on page 35, number 1, just to reveal a little bit about solving inequalities, because we're going to turn around on Friday and look at proving inequalities. That if we assume something is true, can we prove some inequality is true? 
and it's different than solving inequalities. Solving inequalities, what we have done, it may have been a while, but, but and we may not have done anything like this, but at least we're familiar with that idea. The idea of proving is, is a more complicated idea, and we'll pick that up on Friday. Uh, Monday is Labor Day. Won't see you on Monday, but uh, we'll see you on Friday.